Ready when you are, Barry. Uh, okay, I'm ready. I'm just uh, waiting. Waiting. Um, looks like um, it looks like we have a good number of people come back after lunch or dinner or breakfast. Um, and um, we're going to go into the second half of this uh, chemistry and corrosion section. And uh, the first presentation is with Shana Ferrante, who's the fleet chemistry consultant at Dominion Energy. Uh, so, Shana, please uh, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Un un unmute yourself, um, Shana, and then you should be okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, that's good. Sorry, I had to be unmuted. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, it's fine. All right, great. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to present to the ACC users group today. Uh, like Barry said, my name is Shana Ferranti. I'm the fleet chemistry consultant for Dominion Energy. I've been in this role for about two years now. Um, and previously, for the previous 10 years of my career, I did work for GE Betts and Suez. Um, so I would like to start by thanking Bob Trosbeck from Suez for his help in putting this presentation together and for helping me implement the filming amines throughout the Dominion fleet over the last seven years. I also want to thank the chemists at each of our stations who have also been instrumental in making our filming amine applications a success. My presentation is on film forming substance applications for air cool condensers across the Dominion fleet. I'm trying to advance myself. Uh, today I'm going to be discussing three of Dominion's air cooled condenser units that currently feed film forming substances. We have two triple pressure heat recovery steam generators and one circulating fluidized bed unit that all have very large ACPs and feed a film forming substance. All three units utilize an volatile treatment, ABTO with ammonia MEA treatment approach. We are supplementing our chemical feed with the Suez film forming amine or FFA polyamine, which is an OLDA chemistry. We target 20 to 40 PPB of active polyamine residual in the condensate sample. The residual filmer is being tested using the Bengal Rose method. The filmer feed location has been a point of interest and discussion for us as well, which we will discuss later. Each of the units has all ferrous metallurgy, no yellow metals. None of the plants utilize condensate polishers. And the condensate iron levels during normal operation are generally below detection at less than 2 ppb of total iron. However, the iron levels in the IP drums of the triple pressure HERSIG units tended to be higher before we began feeding the filmer. The startup iron levels were most concerning ranging anywhere from 1 ppm to 6 ppm of total iron. The use of the Hawk laser turbinometer for corrosion product transport monitoring has really helped us justify the use of the polyamine and provided us with excellent data to prove its success. Some of the objectives we've had while feeding film forming amines are inspection and operational related. We perform inspections on all of our units at least once per year and twice if possible. The inspection objectives are to look for signs of hydrophobicity or beating of the water on the metal surfaces in the ACC, turbine exhaust ducts, or tenant, the LP drum, IP drum, and HP drums. We look for metal passivation and repair from exposed base metal back to passivated oxide. We also try to determine the dually how air cooled condenser corrosion index in critical areas. Our operational objectives while feeding an FFA have been to minimize downtime corrosion and reduce iron transport during startups. In our ACCs, these two were causing us the most concern. We were seeing flow accelerated corrosion in many areas of the ACC and experiencing high concentrations of iron during startups due to downtime corrosion. Another secondary objective was to reduce the iron levels during normal operation. 
During this whole process, we perform routine lab ICP analysis for chlorides and sulfates, as well as a whole host of other chemical parameters. The picture on the top right was taken on an ACC street cross member and shows a droplet of water beaded on top of the metal. The picture on the bottom right shows beading of the water droplets on the floor of a turbine exhaust duct. These are the things we are looking to see when performing inspections. This chart is showing Hawk laser turbidimeter data versus lab ICP total iron data during a cold plant startup after an outage in 2014. We have used this turbidimeter at two of our facilities. I took these grab samples over a 14 hour period during a cold plant startup at VCheck after an outage in October of 2014 to try to validate the data from the Hawk turbidimeter. The grab samples were sent to Suez's lab for ICP total iron analysis and then compared to the turbidimeter readings at those points during the startup. As you can see, the iron concentrations, concentrations trended right along with the turbidity levels. This gave us a lot of confidence in the instrument readings. It allowed us to use the turbidity readings to correlate it to iron concentrations in the system from that point forward. Capturing data before we start treating the system with a film forming amine can be challenging, it's time consuming, and takes a big effort. However, this is great data to have to prove the success of an application afterwards. This helps us show the benefits of the product. Producing these high levels of iron during a startup is, in my mind, the most significant benefit from the use of film forming amines. We have more data to show you later on the presentation in this area. Um, now I will be sharing information about each of our units with ACCs and their experience with FFAs. First is Virginia City Hybrid Energy Center, or VCheck as we call it. VCheck is a coal biomass fired circulating fluidized bed unit that produces 610 megawatts located in Virginia. Their drum pressure is 2,600 PSIG and puts out 4,500 thousand pounds per hour of steam. This unit came into operation in 2012 and has now become a cycling unit. The makeup water for the plant is ultrafiltration, a two pass RO, and mixed bed demineralizers. Below is some of the operational history of VCheck. High air and leakage rates and corrosion concerns, including flow accelerated corrosion in the ACC during the first few years of operation, resulted in low pH control issues and caused us to require another level of corrosion protection. We were seeing up to 2 ppm of total iron during startups and extended iron transport for days before returning to baseline. Our original chemical treatment regime here included an, an ammonia MEA blend with supplemental ammonia for pH control. We tried to target a pH of 9.8 or 9.9, .9, but could not achieve it. So we operated between 9.4 to 9.6 pH in the boiler feed water and condensate. Because of the above concerns, we began trialing a film forming amine in 2014 and have fed one since then. We control our film or chemical feed by proportioning it to steam flow. We recently switched to a film forming chemistry with no neutralizing amine in 2020. The new product is a water based formula that is easier to feed and handle. Additionally, it contains a secondary surface active chemistry that is providing additional corrosion protection. It is also less impactful on cation conductivity because there is no neutralizing amine in this new product blend. We originally fed the FFA to the condensate pump discharge from 2014 to 2019. We saw a significant reduction in iron throw during startups. The, um, the DASI index reduced from a four in 2014 to a three in 2019. We always saw a robust hydrophobic film in the turbine exhaust duct, but less so in the ACC streets. Poss some possible reasons why we could not get complete coverage across the ACC during that time could be just the massive surface area in the ACC requiring coverage and potential thermal decomposition of the filmer at the high pressure and temperature superheat steam. In 2019, we decided to relocate the feed point to the turbine exhaust duct 
in order to try and target the ACC directly. We used a steam assisted injection system to atomize the product into the TED to get it into the ACC more efficiently. After moving the chemical injection point, we saw significant improvement in the hydrophobic film coverage in the ACC streets during the subsequent inspections. Also, the DASHI index reduced further from a three in 2019 to a one, two in 2020. The photos on this slide were taken during inspections of an ACC street at VCheck and show the improvement in the corrosion index after the film on application. The photo on the left was taken in an ACC street in 2014 prior to feeding any filmer. You can see that there is a lot of exposed bare metal on the cross members and supports throughout the street. There are also signs of FAC around the ACC tube welds. In 2019, after several years of feeding the polyamine chemistry, the DASI in, improved from a four to a three. You can see the base metal starting to repair itself and areas of bare metal are much smaller. During 2020's inspection, the DASI improved even further to a one, two, and there's almost no bare metal left at all. The passivation is also better on the condenser tubes with no FAC present. After we began feeding the polyamine directly to the TED, we saw a much quicker repair to the base metal. Now we will move on to one of our three-on-one triple pressure hearses with a feed forward LP, Warren County Power Station, also located in Virginia. This plant produces 1,370 megawatts of power and has a 3,000 kPPH steaming rate. Warren County went into operation in 2014 and is a base loaded plant with an air cooled condenser, duct burners, and inlet air chilling. Their makeup water system consists of ultra filtration, a two pass RO, and CEDI. Warren County's original chemical treatment approach included an ammonia MEA blended product for pH control. They are ABTO and target a condensate pH of 9.8 to 10. After seeing the results at VCheck, Dominion and Suez began a campaign to use polyamine at all of our sites. We have four units with ACCs, and the last plant is scheduled to begin feeding polyamine by 2022. We also have six plants with conventional water-cooled condensers that currently feed polyamine. We began feeding an FFA at Warren County in May 2017. We injected the chemical directly into the tent from the beginning, and we control the feed rate proportional to steam flow. During the first inspection, a few months after feeding the polyamine, we saw a presence of a hydrophobic film in both the TED and ACC. The iron levels were very low after initiating the filmer feed, but from an inspection standpoint, we continue to see evidence of some FAC issues, which we believe is a result of trapped puddles of water in the bottom areas of the ACC streets, which is causing additional micro droplet impingement on the 90 degree metal support structures. One of the primary areas for, of concern for flow accelerated corrosion are the raised welds around the condenser tube inlets in the ACC streets. In this set of inspection photos, we noted flow accelerated corrosion in 2016 around the tube welds, actively corroding and exposing bare metal, as you can see around the raised top edge and along the side of a few of the tubes. We believe the dot the dossi is a three here on the left photo. We began feeding a film forming amine in 2017, and we have seen the tube welds progressively improve and repair themselves since then. In 2019, we observed improved passivation throughout the ACC streets and around the two welds, resulting in a dossier of one. We also observed beading of the water around the two welds, condenser tube inlets, and down inside the tubes. The last station I will be discussing is one of our three on one triple pressure feed forward OP HERSIGs. Brunswick County Power Station, also located in Virginia. This plant produces 1,358 megawatts of power 
and 3,300 kppH of steam. Brunswick County went into operation in 2016 and is a base loaded plant with a very large air cooled condenser, duct burners, and inlet air chilling. Their makeup system consists of ultra filtration, two pass RO, and CEDI. As far as operational history of Brunswick, their original chemical treatment included an ammonia MEA blend for pH control with a target pH of 9.8 to 10 in the condensate. The initial passivation of the TED and ACC during startup and commissioning consisted of a black magnetite oxide throughout and looked great. However, in late 2017, early 2018, the plant experienced a major air leak in the dog bone expansion joint between the steam turbine and the turbine exhaust duct that caused massive air and leakage. The plant struggled with pH control, which resulted in increased FAC and general corrosion throughout the system. The plant ran with the large air leak for several months because the expansion joint had to be ordered and then replaced during a total plant outage. They began feeding a filmer in late 2017, right around the same time as this air leak began. At Brunswick, they inject chemical into the condensate pump discharge, and it was base fed with a target dose of 20 to 40 ppb of active filmer in the condensate. We saw a dramatic reduction in iron transport during cold plant startups within just a few short months, and they continue trending down. We see low iron deposition during our drum inspections, indicating less corrosion upstream in the ACC. But it did take us several years to see any hydrophobic film in the ACC streets. Brunswick installed a Hawk TU5400 SV laser turbinometer on the condensate after chem feed sample. They have had this analyzer online since before they started feeding the filmer. And not all of our stations utilize this type of analyzer, so we're presenting this data instead of inspection photos for Brunswick County. All of the data was collected and is recorded in the plant Pi system and several plant startups are overlaid on top of each other in this chart. The time frame for this chart is a 24 hour period to show the startup iron transport reduction. The severity of the iron spikes and duration of the iron transport is greatly reduced from one data set to another as we continued feeding the filmer. During a startup prior to feeding any filmer in October of 2017, we saw spikes between 10,000 and 20,000 milli NTU which is about 3 to 6 ppm of total iron. And it took more than 24 hours for turbidity to settle down to baseline. We demonstrated earlier in the presentation that total iron lab data matched up well with the turbidity readings from the instrument. And those concentrations are shown on the right hand side of the graph. After feeding polyamine inconsistently for just 2 to 3 months, we saw a moderate improvement, which is the blue line on the chart. The red line shows a startup several months later and after more consistent feed of the filmer and the turbidity spike never exceeded 5,000 milli NTU or 1.5 ppm of total iron. The time it took for the iron transport to get back down to baseline was also greatly reduced from greater than 24 hours to about four hours. Um, lastly, the green line on the chart shows a more recent startup from May of 2021. The turbidity spike stayed below 1,000 milli NTU or less than 0.3 ppm of total iron and was back to our baseline target of less than 2 ppb within 2 to 3 hours. This data has proven to Dominion that the Suez polyamine does in fact begin to reduce ion transport very quickly and significantly over time, even though we did not see robust beating in the ACC for the first couple of years. Um, the next slide is a video taken during an inspection of a turbine exhaust duct and is what we typically see after feeding polyamine to a unit. This was taken after only 100 days of polyamine feed. You can see that the metal surfaces are totally passivated and hydrophobic, and the water that was remaining in the duct is kicked and just rolls down the duct without absorbing into any of the metal surfaces. It's just replaying a couple of times. The 
The following are our conclusions from our experience with film forming and beans used in air cooled condensers. Iron transport was arrested at VCheck using polyamine, even though they operate at a slightly lower pH. All of our ACC facilities experienced severe iron transport during cooled sortouts prior to feeding the film forming and beans. The FFA feed in all facilities reduced iron transport by orders of magnitude in the clinic in most areas. We recommend feeding any film forming amine proportionally to feed water or feed flow to eliminate any chances of overfeed. And we are continuing to evaluate chemical feed locations, dosing rates, and potentially reducing pH targets. But we will continue to use the polyamine in combination with the recommended pH limits in the condensate of 9.8 or greater. We will wait for further guidance from EBRI and IAPS regarding attempts at reducing these pH targets. We are also considering converting some of our treatment programs from a film forming amine to the new film forming product that has both a, both a film forming amine and non amine component. Uh, that wraps up my presentation. Thank you all for your time and attention, and I will uh, take any questions that you might have. And if I can't answer them, there's a few folks from Suez um, attending that might be able to jump in. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shana. Um, do we have any uh, questions? Uh, Gary Hoffman has a few questions, he says. Can you hear me? Yep. Shana, great presentation. I, I had a question about VCheck. You mentioned that you're feeding the newer product blend at VCheck. Is was that polyamine plus with the surfactant in it as well? It is a polyamine plus product, yes. And uh, we're we're also feeding that at one of our plants, and just to feeding it for a couple of years. I'll, or I mean, excuse me, a couple of months. I'll I'll keep you posted on how we what we find. But have you used the Waltron online analyzer to track the OLDA? Uh, not yet, no, but um, I was informed a few weeks ago that Suez is planning to uh, use one at the remaining um, ACC unit that we have that's not currently on uh, polyamine yet. Um, so we hope to have that in use next year when we're feeding the polyamine plus um, at our last ACC station. Great. I, I would look forward to hearing from you on how that works for you. We we're getting some mixed results. so. I'd, I'd love okay. to talk to you later about that. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Gary. And maybe, uh, is there any other questions? Uh, Shana, based on uh, Gary's uh, question, uh, I have a, I have a, I have a question or just a, uh, a request that you that you would uh, that you could perhaps uh, tell the audience uh, what you consider to be a polyamine, and uh, and and what. Um, is the difference between a polyamine and a and a film forming amine, and 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 what's in and what's in those uh, uh, substances? Well, I guess polyamine is the term I think that Suez uses. Um, it's the OLDA chemistry. You know, we're using a similar product at each of the stations or at two of the stations. The one we're using the new polyamine plus product. Um, so it's all, you know, a similar chemistry. I it's and they're all film forming amines. I think they would all be classified as film forming amines. So do you, do you not know what's in the what's in a polyamine? Uh, poly usually means uh, multiples, but you indicated that there was only one uh, film forming amine. Well, I'll have to let Suez answer that one. Greg Robinson or Bob Drospek that's on the line um, can help answer that. Yeah, we know we know, as I mentioned before, that we've seen at uh, the IAPS uh, FFS conferences that, that um, there's a big difference. There's a big difference in them, and uh, we advise to uh, find out exactly exactly what they uh, exactly what they mean. I'll I'll come back to this in the uh, general discussion at the end, but we have a question here from David uh, David Addison. David. Uh, good morning, Barry. Good morning, everyone. Um, interesting yeah. presentation. Um, you made the comment that 
the ACCs were fully protected, but in the photos and in the video, you could clearly see flash rusting in there, the orange. Have you got any comment on that? Um, typically, when we see that, you know, if you if we take our boot and kind of scrape across it, it doesn't seem to be actively uh, corroding. It seems to be settled from somewhere else um, is what I've seen. Uh, it doesn't seem to be actively corroding in those areas. It just happens to end up there. Um, but if you kind of wipe your boot across it, uh, you don't really see bare metal below. It seems to be protected below. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that flash rusting has to have formed since the unit shut down. So it is active because as soon as you start mm -hmm. up, that will, that will convert back to magnetite or hematite and then transport on through the system. So it's a, it's a probably a pretty good indicator that you don't have full and complete protection in there. Um, just, just, just mm -hmm. a, just an observational comment. And the other one that I had is. OLDA is normally always dosed with OLA. Is is that what's in your products? Um, I can't comment on that. Um, I think one of my Suez uh, reps would have to answer that for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we can have some comments about that uh, about that later because people like to know what uh, uh, what's in these things. And David, uh, your comment about the orange flash rusting, I think, is very apropos. It's uh, basically no different than without with without a film forming substance. Uh, you know, you see the same you see the same thing there. And uh, so, um, I, I don't see any other questions. Uh, Shana, I noticed that you didn't say anything about case, and I suspect because you're using MEA. I know that the case is the case is going to be quite high. C can can you meet the the steam uh, guideline limits uh, on these units? Uh, no, we typically run a little bit higher. Um, we operate um, with a cation conductivity of around 0.5 to 0.6 normally. Um, but we we're routinely looking for chlorides and sulfates, uh, you know, through lab analysis in all of our systems. And they're they are all typically below detection, you know, or less than one ppb. Yes. Uh, yes. And you know, most of that we we already had high cation conductivities before feeding any filmer uh, because of the MEA. Uh, yes. And we've also performed um, low molecular weight <clears throat> organic analysis and haven't seen any increases above the baseline of the MEA. So we assume, you know, some iron leakage and, you know, maybe some amine thermal decomposition are the contributors uh, to the cation conductivity. Yeah. And um, I, I didn't, I didn't quite understand why, why you wouldn't consider uh, getting rid of the MEA once you went to FFA, FFS. Um, well, at a, at a facility like VTEC, we did initially start out during commissioning on ammonia only. Um, and we could never, no matter how much we fed in, we were feeding two, um, two totes of ammonia at the same time and, and couldn't keep up the pH. Um, so the MEA has greatly helped us maintain our pHs throughout the system. Um, and we've been very hesitant to go away from that. And I think I heard you say that the polyamine does does not contain an, a, a, another neutralizing or alkalizing amine. Uh, there, the one product that we use at Brunswick and Warren County uh, does have a very small amount of MEA in it. That you know, also if you know when we were feeding a little bit higher rates at the beginning, um, at uh, contributed a little bit to our cation conductivity, but we're at pretty low dosages now. Yes, good. Uh, yeah, and thank you for confirming that the um, the turbine exhaust is a good is a good location for the in injection of FFS. Uh, that that's something that a lot of people ask. Yeah, we've had really good success with that. Good. Well, that's um, uh, that's excellent, um, uh, Shana. There aren't any more questions at the moment, but we'll come back to some. Um, Oh, but uh, it looks like Greg Robinson has has raised his hand. So, Greg, if you're still here, you can make a quick comment. Uh, I am. I know you're short on time. Um, Jane had addressed. There's a couple 
questions in the chemistry. Uh, I can I can talk about that now or later if appropriate. Um, you can't, uh, uh, Greg. It's okay. Just go ahead. Okay. I, well, I, I heard a couple questions in the chemistry, and, and there are a couple chem different chemistries she's using. Um, as Shana mentioned, one of the the, the, the products she, she's been using for a while is a concentrated product. It's uh, basically OLDA. Um, David Addison's a little bit of uh, OLA in there as well, uh, but largely OLDA uh, and, and the product uh, with a tiny bit of uh, uh, MEA um, as well. Now, the, the next chemistry, the Polyme Plus, I heard a couple questions there. That is a filmer only product. Um, and it is, as Shana pointed out, um, you know, contains a uh, amine. Um, and non amine uh, secondary surface active uh, chemistry as well. Is that it, Greg? Uh, that, yeah, uh, yeah. I, okay, that, I, yeah. I tried yeah, to answer pretty quickly thing. there. But... Yeah, no, that's good. Thank Thanks. Uh, people, as you, as you know, and as we've talked in the past, are, are interested to know, you know, what these are, because as I, as I showed you before, David and I had put together a list of all of, of all the wide range of products that are in existence and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, future users or users now that are not satisfied and want to move. They, they basically have to, uh, you know, know, know what these products are and, and, and how, and why and how you can move. So, so thanks very much. So Shana, thanks for uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation, and uh, we'll move on to the next one, which is um, by Ken Kurig from uh, Hack. And uh, Ken, please go ahead and introduce yourself and move ahead. Okay, are you seeing my presentation? Uh, not just at the moment. Okay, I I went to share it. Uh, let's see why it's not sharing. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Just put it on full screen. See it now? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Ken Couric. Uh, I've been uh, with Hawk for about 26 years, and my focus has been on the power industry. Uh, supporting our team throughout the US. I've, I've done a lot of work uh, in the past several years on uh, corrosion product monitoring. And this, uh, between the first session and uh, seeing this uh, presentation, we, we've seen a lot of great results uh, and we've seen a lot of things that we should be doing in order to minimize flow accelerated corrosion. And there were a lot of great photos uh, shared of you know, what the, what the insides, what the metal should look like. Unfortunately, we, we don't always get a chance to take a look at inside uh, our equipment to see what's going on. And so in order to assure that those changes we're making, whether it be uh, the uh, pH or whether it be uh, using a film forming uh, amine or a product or, you know, whatever we're doing to try to uh, minimize our FAC, we, we have to find out, uh, you know, are we being successful or not? And uh, both uh, Jeff and Shana uh, shared an online method uh, called uh, laser nephilometry. Uh, they've also mentioned the uh, ferrazine test. What I'm going to do is, is just take a little time to discuss that in a little bit more detail and give a real practical uh, kind of a quick overview lesson of how you can implement that in your plant or in the facilities that you're responsible for. And this is a very easy, uh, relatively low cost and relatively labor free method of just verifying what is going on in your process. So I'm going to uh, start off I'll talk about some guidelines and sample conditioning because no matter what we do, if we don't start off properly and do things right, uh, our results are not going to have any kind of a meeting. I'm gonna talk about some methods of analysis, talk about the online technology and what we need to do to validate that. 
So first of all, why are we talking about this now? Well, FAC is a problem in any kind of a steam system, uh, you know, throughout the fossil, uh, combined cycles, HERSIGs, nuclear, but especially when we're dealing with air-cooled condensers. And monitoring these corrosion products in the condensate before and after a condenser kind of gives us an indication of, of what's going on, uh, especially as we saw in the upper transport ducts or the streets as they're called. Uh, a lot of times I'm asked, where should I be monitoring this? I can't monitor uh, this you know, everywhere. Well, anywhere in the steam cycle, but uh, again, uh, you know, this is this is a focus area. So the the level of total iron, and again, I say total iron. This is misunderstood by many. We need to be looking at the dissolved and particulate, even though particulate is about ninety over ninety percent of what our FAC is going to be. It's dependent on the feed water and the condensate pH, as we saw in the presentations in the first session. So. Uh, levels of iron below that 10 ppb are consistently achievable with pH levels around 9.8. And so the prior presentations did a great job of, of addressing and talking about that, uh, as well as uh, downstream of a typical filter. Uh, we can we can control them down under 5 ppb. So this is something that I'm I'm making an assumption of these key parameters that these are already taking place. Uh, most uh, plants have very good sample panels. They're put together by people that know how to do this. Pressure reduction, cooling, isolation, sample line, length, routing size, flow velocities, that's all taken care of. So we're not ignoring this, but we are assuming that this has been addressed. If this has not been addressed, then we're going to have a very hard time getting accurate samples, whether they be graph sample or online samples. So these are some what I call key keep in minds for sample conditioning. You need a continuous stream of sample and ideally under steady state conditions, because if we're varying the conditions, you know, it's very hard to see what's going on. The other thing is, uh, we want to do a steady stream. We, we're looking for something at equilibrium, a, a steady state. So if you've got a shutoff valve, you don't want to go and open that shutoff valve and then take a sample. You want to open that up and give it at least a couple of hours, more preferably if you can. Uh, this has been a problem in a lot of facilities where we go in to do testing and then find out that we have to make some change or alteration and then it upsets the sample. Particle filters, this is an obvious one. It seems obvious, but believe it or not, I, I've been to facilities where we start doing the iron testing and we start getting very low levels and they go back and say, this just doesn't sound right. And to only find out that they've got a, a filter right in front of where we're sampling. Uh, if you're taking out uh, the particulates, and again, I mentioned that over 90% of the, the, the iron that we're going to be looking at is in the particulate form. So if we're filtering it out, we're not going to see it. Uh, and that's another thing I'll talk a little bit more about later, but you need to be looking at total iron. If you're looking at only dissolved iron, you're going to miss the picture. And I was just to a plant recently where they were measuring dissolved iron and they kept telling me, Oh, we don't have an FAC problem. We we get zeros all the time. Well, you may very well be getting zeros uh, with dissolve, but you're not going to be getting zeros with your particulate. Then the next thing is is we we can't measure down to single digit part per billion levels if we're using bottles that are contaminated with iron. And we know that most containers, uh, whether they be glass or, 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 or uh, nylon or PTFE or plastic or whatever they are, are gonna have iron. So you need to use a high purity uh, concentrated acid to rinse them out. And, and a lot of what I'm talking about today is covered very well in the IAPS guidelines. There's a 10-step program for preparing uh, 
containers for for sampling. I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail, but you can reference those guidelines. What I did want to mention is some of the other methods of analysis that are out there that sometimes don't get mentioned. Uh, we know there's AA and there's ICP and uh, mass spec, and you know those are great pieces of instrumentation. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why those are not used though in a lot of facilities. One is they're very expensive. Uh, second, uh, they require trained operators, uh, you know, either chemists or people trained in laboratory instrumentation. And then if you look at a couple of these, like the AA and the, uh, the AES, the uh, limit of detection is down around 7 ppb. So it's not that they can't be used, but if you're looking to get down to the you know, under 5 PPB range, uh, they're going to fall a little bit short. So I wanted to bring these up because I know some uh, utilities, they do have these present in their corporate labs and sometimes they'll send samples out. You know, we're not trying to say that these aren't good, but, you know, we have to realize what the limitations are. What I'm going to focus on in today's discussion, though, are the three in red, the uh, B&W, uh, filter charts, which everyone's probably very familiar with, corrosion product sampling, and then finally, visible spectroscopy. So these charts, uh, this goes back to the, uh, you know, the filter charts. Uh, many facilities still use these. They're, they're great. I mean, they're a very visible means, but what they are giving you is a period of time. They're not giving you a continuous measurement. So, uh, they're a good indicator, and if you're running very steady state and you have a good program and everything's under control, they can be a great check. But if you're uh, if you're doing a lot of uh, startups, uh, you know it's going to be a little harder to use them. You can use them, but but again, realizing uh, the potential limitations. Corrosion product sampler, uh, you know, very good uh, method, and ag again. Uh, this is a, uh, a way of quantifying particulates, and it's going to locate, identify the, the sources, the rates. It's going to track uh, the paths. Uh, but again, it's not a it's not a continuous. It's not giving you an instantaneous value, but it is a, a very uh, you know valuable uh, tool that can be used. Uh, along with other sampling techniques. And here is just a uh, schematic of how it works. You're basically collecting the particles on a, uh, in a filter, with, which is acid digestible. Uh, you look at the uh, fluid over a period of time. It can be you know, anywhere from an hour to, to, a, to a day. You remove the filters, you digest them and you just determine how much corrosion product sampling. So it's a, it's a quantitative analytical method, and I, I think it's a significant one, so I, I wanted to bring it up and talk about it. Now, this is the one that was uh, referenced, I believe, by uh, Jeff in the session one. This is uh, uh, visible uh, spectroscopy. So we're, where you, I'll talk a little bit about the particular test, but we're measuring uh, the uh, samples at 562 nanometers. Uh, we're looking at a color change, and this can be done uh, on any bench uh, spectrophotometer. You need to be using a, a good uh, spectrophotometer though with very good optics, since we're going to be looking at uh, you know single digit part per billion. This is not something you want to do on a hand handheld uh, colorimeter. What we're using here is the ferrazine method. Uh, this is based on a, an adaptation from a method that was developed back in 1970, and it's been fine-tuned uh, to be able to measure down to a part per billion. And it's a, it's a two-part reagent. It has a color development or a color developer, developer as I say, that's what we kind of call as the ferrazine. And then it has TGA, which is thioglycolic acid. That's what's digesting the particles. So 
It's taking all of the dissolved particles, whether they be magnetite or hematite, getting them all into solution so that we can develop the color. And in order to do this, you require a digestion. Uh, the figures I'm giving here are based on uh, in-house work that we did to de uh, determine the minimum temperature and the least amount of time taken to get a 99% plus uh, uh, reduction. And so you see at 135 degrees C for 30 minutes reduces all of the iron present, gets it all in solution so that we can uh, you know, make this measurement. Uh, and what you see there in the picture is just one example of a digester, but anything that is going to give you be able to you know, heat your uh, sample up uh, for that period of time and that temperature. Now, what I'm going to talk about is the actual procedure. So, so how do you, what do you do from step one to getting a iron reading? Well, what you see there is a one inch sample cell. That's a glass cell that's going to be used in the spectrophotometer that has iron in it. So before you can use that, the best way to clean this we found is actually using the reagent, that ferrazine reagent. You uh, fill up the sample cell with DI water. Using your plant DI water is fine, or if you don't have, have access to that, you know, any DI water is going to work well. You put eight drops of ferrazine, you cover it with some fer parafilm, let it sit for 30 minutes. You don't have to heat this up. You're just getting uh, rid of the iron that's on, in this sample cell. The digestion vials that you're going to use for your sample, though, those need to be prepared, and they only need to be prepared one time. So the first time you use them, uh, these are uh, using these are 20 mil cells. They're designed for digestion, so we fill them up to 12 mils, add eight drops of ferrazine, and then we heat it overnight, basically 24 hours at 135 degrees C, and that will get rid of all the iron. Now, I want to caution you because this has come up uh, many times. 135 degrees C, this is water. This is under pressure. So you want to make sure you're using um, digestion files that are approved for that. You don't, you know, and, and, and use proper safety techniques. This should be done in a hood. You should have proper PPE safety uh, glasses as a minimum. Uh, no, if you fill this up to this level and heat it, you will not have a problem. You do not want to put 20 mils of water and heat it to 135 as there's a danger that you know, these vials can, can explode. Then again, as I said before, you want to collect the sample from a continuous stream. If you're using your uh, sample panel, that's a great place because you already have proper conditioning. Uh, we'll talk about the laser nephilometer. If you have that set up properly, you can take it directly from the outlet of the laser nephilometer. You want to make sure that you know none of the flow is disturbed, none of the tubing's uh, disturbed when we're doing this uh, sampling. And even after you've cleaned your digestion vial, rinse the vial out you know a few times with the sample before you take your final sample. So once you have this uh, sample collected, you add eight drops of ferrazine, you replace the cap, you're going to heat it for 30 minutes, and then when you're done, you remove it, and again, make sure you cool it, because if you open that vial at 135 degrees C, that water is going to spray, and that becomes a dangerous situation. Then we uh, go to determine the reagent blank on the spectrophotometer. So you're going to fill that one inch cell that you had uh, cleaned with DI water. You wanna make sure you're wiping the outside of it. Uh, fingerprints will be detected by a spectrophotometer. You're going to zero it. You're gonna add eight drops of ferrazine. Why are we adding eight drops of ferrazine to DI water? Well, the ferrazine has a slight amount of color. So what we're doing now, we're really creating a blank for that color. You're gonna put it back in the spectrophotometer, take a reading. It's usually gonna be very low, you know, around one part per billion. That is gonna be your blank. 
you'll subtract that from the reading that you're going to be taking once you put your uh, sample in. So finally, uh, next thing you're going to do is you're going to take your, uh, your digested sample uh, that, you've, uh, that you've prepared. And again, I always suggest doing five or six different samples. I, I've done this at uh, multiple plants uh, all over the country, and it seems every time I do this, I'll take six samples, and I'm going to have one that for some reason just is an outlier. So I throw that value out, and I average the other five. And, uh, so I always suggest, you know, six is a good number, uh, you know, but there's nothing special about it. You just want to make sure you're getting a, a good representation. If you take two or three and they read within a, a tenth of, or a couple of tenths of a part per billion, you know, that's that's pretty good. So you're going to take a reading, you're going to subtract that reagent blank, and now you have a total iron value. So that's the laboratory of the grab sample analysis. Uh, we want something that's going to be continual, something that's going to give us a, a real time or instantaneous reading. Well, unfortunately, there's no good online method currently available. That's a direct iron reading. So we're talking about using what we call uh, laser nephilometers. This is a surrogate method. And what a laser nephilometer does is it's, it's basically taking a, a stream of light. Here you see a, a light bulb, but what we're using is a laser. It's uh, reflecting it at 90 degrees. We're making the measurement. Some of you may be familiar with uh, particle monitoring. Particle monitoring is somewhat similar. It's just, it is more where it's casting a shadow rather than reflection. And you might say, well, why can't we use that? Well, you can, and it has been used. Unfortunately, particle monitoring will only see particles down to two micron in size. Uh, we've seen studies that say the average particle size for FAC, and again, this is average, it's going to vary uh, from location to location, depending on what kind of chemistry, what kind of plant you're running, is about one part per billion. We know for a fact that a lot of the FAC is going to be in the form of submicron particles. So this is giving you, uh, you know, a more comprehensive view. Here's kind of an, just another visual of what's happening. And again, there's uh, laser nephilometers with different wavelengths. We, we're not going to get into that, which wavelength you use. Some wavelengths will allow better resolution of the small particles. Other are less sensitive to color. Uh, the bottom line is really any laser nephilometer is going to be useful for this and uh, suitable. So. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be any one particular uh, wavelength. Here's just a visible, uh, you know, installation. You see the uh, laser nephilometer there on the bottom. In fact, this is the uh, one that was referenced by uh, uh, Shana in the last presentation, the TU-5400. It has a quarter-inch tubing going in and coming out. And that really all you need is a nylon tubing. Uh, it works really well. And then you see a controller on the top. The one on the top there is one that can actually do the conversion and read out in PPB iron, but there's other controllers that will just read out in uh, nephilometric units or NTU. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about you know, how we do that the correlation. So you see here, here's Here's two different curves that were done using a laser nephilometer, one for hematite and one for magnetite. Uh, you see that they're quite a bit different, but they're both linear. And that linear uh, component is uh, very important because that's what allows us to do what we're going to do. And the second thing is, is that they go through zero or nearly zero. The empirical point there, the zero point the 7 milli NTU. I'll say, well, how do we know that? Well, it's just something we've experimentally done. Uh, so if you had absolutely pure 18 mega ohm water with nothing in it, it would, you know, it's not going to read zero NTU. 
you're going to get a reading around 7 million TU. And uh, so that's very useful as well. So what we can do now is we can take those samples that we are collected from the sample panel or right from the outlet of the net laser nephilometer. And that's why I mentioned, if possible, you can take your samples right from the outlet. That way, you know you're comparing them at the exact same points. What we do is we take those samples, we run it on the laser nephil, we, we take a reading off the laser nephilometer right when we're ready to sample. So for example, uh, here, I think we're looking at probably 25 million TU if you look over uh, to the uh, axis on the left. And then you look down and we're reading, you know, depending on which curve you're at, anywhere from 2.3 to 3.0 uh, PPB iron. And that's the reading we're gonna get off the lab. Those are the two measurements you need. So let's just say 2.6 uh, PPB iron that you got off your uh, lab spectrophotometer. 20, well, let's say, I, I guess it's uh, yeah, 30, 35 a million TU off your uh, nephilometer. You put it into uh, this spreadsheet, which, by the way, is something we prepared. And uh, if anybody wants it, I can send it over to you, or you know, or you can create your own. What this does is creates a specific uh, equation for your facility based on your mixture of uh, hematite, magnetite, the, the particular chemistry that you're running, and it gives you an equation at the bottom there. You said your iron equation. Uh, it creates that uh, equation. You put that equation either into your controller, if it's uh, a smart controller that can handle it, or you can put it into your uh, DCS uh, and uh, read out directly in PPB iron. So now you've created for yourself an online iron analyzer surrogate, but it's giving you continuous readings it's, it's really uh, hands off. Uh, there's really no maintenance required. Uh, and you don't have to repeat this uh, process that we just went through unless you have a major change, you're changing your chemistry or something in your system has changed drastically. I would uh, recommend going back and rerunning this. But if otherwise, you know, you just continue running with this. Once in a while, you may need to go ahead and clean out your a sample cell, uh, we do have, uh, the Hawk model does have a cleaning unit you can purchase. Uh, if you're, uh, some of the uh, filming of means may coat the cell a little bit. If you run into that, we have a cleaning uh, unit that uh, we can provide. Uh, different models, you know, may have, you know, different options available. Here's some actual data, although we, you know, we've seen some good data uh, in the prior presentations, but it's showing, uh, you know, the, uh, the turbine th uh, turn, the high pressure steam, uh, the turbidity, or, which is the laser nephilometer is in uh, blue. You have seen the calculated value in yellow, and then the lab measurements in, in black. So seeing a very good correlation between what's happening in the process and what we're seeing uh, in the laboratory and the uh, laser nephilometer. So finally, uh, with any kind of program, uh, you, in order to validate it, make sure it's uh, doing what you want it to do or what you think it's doing, you need to make sure it's linear. Uh, again, we've done the work here. We've shown that these curves are linear. Uh, you've got to look at your accuracy, uh, your repeatability, your reproducibility, and then your detection limit. And, you know, without going into those in any great detail, uh, we've been doing this work for a, a number of years now at all kinds of different facilities. Uh, you know, we've validated it. We showed that it does hold true. Uh, very useful in... Uh, and verifying that your uh, filming uh, means or your film forming products are being effective. 
Uh, it's very useful in determining, you know, when you're able to come back online and just overall that, uh, you know, you're, you're running smoothly, detecting any kind of events that might be occurring. So it's a, it's a set of eyes that is on your system, you know, 24, seven, 365. And, uh, is again, uh, another option open to you to, you know, monitoring your FAC program, you know, in between those times that you can actually open it up and, and take a look at. So it's a very quick, very high level overview. Uh, but I thank you for your time and be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Ken. Very nice uh, presentation. And I, I must say that I uh, like your enthusiasm to be part of the slide itself. And uh, it just shows how keen you are to get this iron monitoring stuff done properly. So uh, thank you. I don't um, I don't see any questions uh, here, but we'll come back to um, we'll come back at the discussion period. But I did just I did just want to mention I had I had uh, sent uh, I, I had sent you some time ago um, the importance of these uh, startup uh, processes. And um, IAPS has um, has developed uh, these surrogate methods into into a decay process. So uh, with a decay map, and so you can assess all the different ways of shutting down the unit and seeing which are good or bad, and plotting them onto the uh, decay map. And uh, so we're uh, interested if uh, any of the people who are presenting or any of the others. Are interested in taking part. We're looking for some for some test sites. So Ken, thank you very much for a nice uh, presentation. We'll come back. We'll come back to you in uh, in half an hour if that's okay. Sure. Thank you. And the next the next presentation is by Ronnie uh, Wagner from Rikon in Germany. And for those of you that don't know. Uh, don't know uh, Ronnie and Rikon are somewhat of the uh, of of the grandchild uh, company of of some of the very first developments of uh, FFS. Uh, I remember uh, fondly and with interest uh, meeting some of his uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Soltanov and Kukushkin and uh, Martinova in Moscow uh, in in about 1987 or 88. Uh, when when the work was uh, first started using ODA. So, Ronnie, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, please introduce yourself and, and move ahead. Thanks, Barry. Uh, yes, so let's start to... So, can you see the, the presentation? Yeah, just put it on full screen now, yeah, please. I try. Is it, yeah. Yep, is it full, full screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Barry. So, yes. Hi, everyone. So, regards from Germany. <clears throat> um, yes, Rikon is uh, dealing with the uh, FFA topic since uh, yeah, more than 30 years. And uh, we are working mainly for uh, uh, well, well, doing some research in, in the 1980s, starting for nuclear applications. And uh, yeah, now we are working in several uh, uh, fossil units, a combined cycle, and also uh, industrial cycle plants with our um, film forming amine products, which are mainly based on uh, octadecylamine, so ODA. And um, so I will give you a short overview about the preservation topic with uh, film forming amines and com uh, in water steam cycles with uh, ACC, but also without. And uh, so let's start with some basic informations about the film forming amines. Uh, give you a sh short overview about the international standards of using that. Also on the main effects of film forming amines, why they can be used for preservation. Uh, also, some 
yeah, general information about uh, the possible uh, preservation principles in terms of uh, flexible operation and also on uh, planned and long term standstill periods and give you some examples from uh, our experience. So let's start with that. So we heard already a lot of the uh, yeah confusion before uh, 2016, where uh, there was a increasing interest in the use of film forming a means, but uh, there was the problem that no one knows exactly what is meant by that topic. So that's not a um, yeah, it's not a defined chemical group. It's a uh, there were a lot of manuf manufacturer specific products on the market, which do contain film forming amines and also uh, that were blended with uh, yeah, neutralizing amines with dispersants with uh, sometimes oxygen scavengers. And even there were um, products called as film forming amines who doesn't have any amines in it. So the exact uh, product composition were often unknown or confidential. So there was less knowledge and less uh, international or independent uh, guidance on the use of these products. And um, with the release of the first uh, IAPS guideline on uh, the application of film forming substances in 2016, there was a yeah, main step forward because um, the first time there was a standardization in the terminology that film forming amines is a typical uh, yeah, chemical group and uh, everything else is a film forming amine product or a film forming product without amines. And uh, already in this uh, um, technical guidance document, there's also a chapter who is discussing uh, um, yeah, the issues uh, or the, the points you have to look at when you have systems with air-cooled condensers and you want to use the film forming uh, in mind products or film forming products. And in 2019, there was a, a release of the second uh, guidance documents on film forming substances, which is focusing more on the industrial boiler side, also with uh, systems with a lower makeup water quality. And uh, also in that uh, technical guidance documents, there is a chapter who uh, addresses uh, information on uh, air cooled condenser operation. So, uh, why are these film forming amines uh, used uh, in, in terms of uh, preservation? So, the main effect, and we have seen it already in some presentations, is the formation of a protective layer on the surface, which is uh, uh, or which has a hydrophobic character when it's uh, the, the surface is dried and uh, in um, in operation there is a double amine layer so there is a uh, yeah diffusion resistant um, layering that prevents the uh, connection of oxygen to the base material and so far corrosion is inhibited and because of the very strong adsorption effect and the ion bonding of the molecules on the surface, there is a long-term preservation effect when the unit is in standstill. So the layer is not removed or degradating over time uh, when the system is in shutdown. The second point, uh, which is uh, very interesting, is that these uh, Amines have a mobilizing effect on uh, porous oxide layers and also on uh, corrosion active uh, deposits uh, like uh, especially chlorides. They are removed from the surface and um, which leads to a extreme uh, uh, decreasing of stress corrosion cracking, especially in uh, crevice and uh, in, in, in areas where there's an accumulation of these deposits because there is a, uh, a drying and uh, re-wetting uh, and um, so that there is a much higher concentration of these depositions than in the, on the base surface. Next important point is that these amines are like tensides lowering the surface tension of water, which uh, leads to a strong decrease of the uh, diameter of the droplets 
of the first condensate and also of the wet steam uh, bubbles, which leads to a, a very good effect to protect the surface because the impact when these drops uh, are con uh, getting in contact with the with the surface is less. And so the, in combination with the protective layouts, which, which have formed the iron removal from the surface is strongly decreased, which leads to a reduc reduced FAC in, in, in single and also in two phase flows, which we have already seen in the presentations before. So uh, from my point of view, I will get uh, some information more on the preservation principles. Um, we have already heard that uh, that there are uh, plenty of units which are in a cycling mode or which have uh, faced unplanned or unpredicted standstill and um, yeah, who never know when to start and when to stop. And for such units, um, yeah, a planned uh, preservation scenario is not possible. So that they are going on a continuous and steady injection of uh, FFA at low concentrations. Um, the uh, values given in blue are for our product, but you have seen the, um, the other products were in the same range. The concentration is depending on the chemistry and the time, uh, which is um, um, or on the operation time and the standstill. And um, yeah, so you can have a very uh, st a steady uh, con and continuous injection of these uh, FFAs. And um, normally it's, they are injected on the suction side of the feed water system or on the condensate line to have a cycling all around the system and um, build up the protective layer in all parts of the cycle. Uh, if there's a condensate polishing plant that can, it can be uh, in operation. Um, also, the water chemical values will be impact uh, when you start the dosage because of the removal effects. But um, after a while, they will attend to normal levels because the system has um, yeah, accumulated enough of the FFA and you just keep the residual concentration as low as uh, possible. The other point is for, uh, for units running on a yeah, seasonal plan, which are shut down during a winter time or which have a planned revision. Um, so the scheduled shutdown um, is known, the date is known, and then you can go for a very short operational period with the uh, FFA just for the preservation. The injection has to start a few days before the shutdown. You will need a high feed rate in that time and also a higher concentration at the end to be sure that all the surface of the cycle is protected by the FFA. And um, if you're going back on operation and you're, uh, uh, it's necessary to have a, a follow-up injection depending on the time of your operation, because especially in the, uh, in the steam generator, the uh, um, protective layer uh, is removed very fast because of the steam volatility of the product. And so there is a, a need of a continuous uh, injection, or if there is a longer period of running and you just want to protect the system uh, before the next shutdown, then there is a possibility to do a re-preservation uh, with a shorter injection period and also with a with a lower target concentration because in some areas of the cycle there will still be a, um, a layer remaining and so you will need less product and uh, less time to build up a complete protective layer. In that case, uh, the injection uh, it would be a good idea to have it directly in front of the air-cooled condenser because it's the part with the uh, with the highest surface. So you will protect these uh, at first. And uh, if there's not that possibility, it's also uh, possible to to use the condensate or feed water line. But then it will take a longer period um, until you will have a full coverage of the air-cooled condensers with the film-forming product.
Um, also, uh, for such a preservation, the condensate polishing unit should be bypassed during injection. This is uh, because the uh, unit will remove the um, part of the FFA and this will, uh, you have to add this additionally and also the, the resins uh, will be uh, loaded with that. They can be cleaned, but um, yeah, it will cost external time and, and, and money. And um, so uh, it's better to, to, to don't use the condensate and polishing unit during the, the preservation. Also, the water chemical uh, values will be uh, uh, higher affected because of the higher concentration of the film former and the faster release of impurities from the cycle. To give you some, some, some examples on that, um, the first one is an a, a industrial scale plant in, in uh, Israel, uh, which was uh, built by Siemens uh, Austria. And uh, they had the problem that uh, the plant was ready on time, but the grid connection was not ready. So they need to do a, a layup for several weeks or months, they did not exactly know. And um, especially to protect the air cooled condenser from corrosion after the commissioning. So um, they decided to inject our product in front of the condenser and uh, did a measurement of the FFA concentration in the condensate to uh, uh, be sure that there is a, a good film formation and a good passivation uh, in the condenser surface. And after that, they did a, a visual inspection to control the, the preservation effect. Um, and what they found was that there were hydrophobic surfaces in the condenser and also in the feed water system. And also during the startup, there were no uh, issues because of corrosion. The plant was uh, very fast on time. And um, yeah, here are some pictures from the, from the feed water system and uh, also from the condensate receiving tank. Unfortunately, we have no pictures from inside from the ACC, so I couldn't show you that, but um, especially in, in that areas, uh, we, we did see a good uh, hydrophobic surface and uh, no uh, signs of corrosion or anything else. Uh, second uh, example is a, a combined cycle unit in, in Germany, um, which has uh, two gas turbines, two HRSG and um, uh, one steam turbine. The unit has no condensate polishing plant and uh, has to go on a flexible operation with very less operation hours. So they were on uh, about 400 to 800 hours per year. And uh, but when they uh, had the chance to uh, produce energy, so they want to start up very fast. Um, because of the long standstill periods, they had already uh, established a preservation procedure using uh, nitrogen in the steam generator, and uh, they did a drying in the condenser. But they still had problems because uh, of very high iron levels during startup especially in the IP section. And also they uh, had a clogging of their uh, filters of the condensate system, uh, which uh, leads to uh, interruption of startup process and then the filters need to be cleaned. So it was not, they were not satisfied with the situation and they decided to uh, go with the film forming product um, to do some additional uh, protection and uh, we did, uh, the, the plan was to, to do the preservation in several steps because of the short operation time and the daily start stop operation. Um, we couldn't inject that much of our product in, the, in a very short time. So we needed several operation steps to um, inject the, the needed amount. Uh, the complete online monitoring equipment was in operation. They measured the pH, the case and also the degas conductivity. And we are, were doing some grab sampling for the FFA analytic and also for iron monitoring. And um, 
the results were very uh, convincing. So they reduced their total commissioning startup time about 50% compared to the uh, situation before. Also, the iron concentration in the in the IP section were reduced by around 70%. And also, they did not need any more the nitrogen injection for the for the HRSG. And also, the drying was only done um, if the system was on a on a standstill for several months and uh, an additional method. So uh, the brown spots you see on the picture on the right side, these are uh, drops of condensate uh, where some iron oxide is uh, inside. So uh, especially after the uh, first and second application of the um, film former, we found that in the condensate uh, or in the condenser, there were uh, some oxide present, but this was oxide coming from the system. So there was no uh, rusty corrosion uh, in the condenser. It was uh, released oxides from the system, which were catch captured in the, in the condensate. And when the condensate was drained, so the, the oxide was drying and it was like a powder on the bottom of the, of the condenser. And the last example, which is a, a cold fired unit in, in Germany, which is using um, only for a redispatch operation to stabilize the grid. And uh, because of that, it is uh, necessary to start up very quickly. And uh, the system was uh, 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 yeah, was it already in shutdown when they decided to uh, to do a preservation with the film forming a mine. So we need to wait to have some uh, operation, and um, this was during a trial for uh, some measurements. So we had three days to inject the. Uh, other con product in the in the system we use the uh, existing dosing point the main condensate line after the condensate polishing unit and uh, after the condensate pump so we were on the high pressure side um, you see here this is the uh, pump for the uh, preservation so we did this uh, during these three days with a higher feed rate to inject as much product as possible to um, protect the, the cycle um, in all areas. And uh, for the follow-up dosing, they are using these small dosing pumps to just uh, have a residual concentration of some PPP in the, in the feed water and uh, to achieve the, the press or to keep the preservation layer uh, stable during the few hours of operation um, they are working on. One thing we, we saw was that especially the, the magnetite layer uh, in the uh, HP section was uh, uh, yeah, improved because before the FFA application, it was a very porous and uh, yeah, very um, um, yeah, rough layer on the, on, the, um, on the surface of the, the heater tubes and um, after the FFA application, the, this surface become much more smoother and, and finer, and um, which uh, also explains the, by the, the release of this porous layer on the top and the more dense uh, magnetite layer after the application from, from the amine. So um, we found that uh, after several uh, represervation steps, also the iron con concentration was the same as during their standard uh, continuous operation before the, the, the shift to the, the redish, redispatch uh, operation mode. So we were below five PPP. And uh, also there was no extra drying necessary for the long-term protection of the steam system. So uh, as we have already heard in uh, different uh, presentations that day that the application of film forming mines have a lot of benefits uh, compared to other technologies, especially for the long-term preservation, but also for flexible operation. 
and um, also can help to solve uh, FAC problems in air cooled condenser operation. Um, the startup process after a standstill, standstill is uh, improved, and uh, especially the, the time to reach the parameters for turbine operation are decreasing, and uh, so the consumption of water and fuel in that time is is uh, decreasing, so which has a major effect on the cost of the plant. And uh, as I said already, the operation can additional benefits um, like the reduced FAC, reduced stress track corrosion, and also an uh, increased heat transfer by removal of these porous oxide layers in, in the system. So uh, thanks everyone for watching. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, uh, yeah, please let me know. Yeah, Ronnie, thank you uh, very much for a nice uh, presentation. Um, and uh, we'll see if there are any uh, questions. We we might also say that this uh, that, that this Oticon product is the uh, I think it's the only only product that's been used in uh, nuclear plants, isn't it, around the world? Let's see if there's any um, let's see if there's any questions. Um, uh, Ken uh, Ken Kurek has a has a question. Yeah, I think you answered my question, original question, Rani. Uh, I put this in there so that I wouldn't forget, but you mentioned that uh, the, I think the conductivity will go up uh, temporarily, but that leads me to another question. Uh, does this product actually get under the corrosion and penetrate it, or is it going over the surface of it? Uh, no, uh, as you have seen on the on the you know, one of the last pages, um, the oxide layers, or if there is a porous oxide layer on the on the top of the uh, yeah surface, um, this will be removed. We see this also by the measurement of uh, uh, this um, water chemistry, uh, um, the iron that. Um, after a few hours of uh, injection, we see a, a peak of the um, total iron uh, in, the, in, in several parts of the cycle, which uh, shows that there is a, a yeah, removal of these products um, by the injection of the film forming amine. And also the, the, for, the, for chloride, uh, there the direction it is much faster a uh, few hours after injection so it takes not very long um you will see a a very strong increase of the chloride levels in the in the water the the absolute height of this uh, peak is uh, plant specific but there is a peak in in every application we we've done uh, during the first hours and uh, iron is a little bit later after one day when the concentration in the cycle is a little bit higher. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Ronnie. They're, they're interesting uh, questions, of course, Ken, because we're, that's one of the uh, major uh, uncertainties at the moment is what these, um, what these FFS do to the growth of of the oxides on the um, on on the various surfaces, not only in the in the condensate, but the feed water, the boiler, and the and the steam, and that was um, the focus of the, uh, the symposium that we had at um, at at IEPS in September. So we have a we did we did have a question um, uh, from AHD asking how much it costs, but we don't usually include that in these types of meetings. And uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, he can contact um, uh, Ronnie uh, if Scott puts his, uh, his email address on the chat, then we can deal with it that way. And there's a, um, uh, there's a question from Gregory Smith, please.
Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, so my question is, um, in, in cases where FFAs or FFSs are applied uh, to plants with condensate polishing, what's the um, what what has the experience been about how long the polishers need to be bypassed for that? Is it just for the uh, duration of the application? Is it for some time afterwards? And if so, what's the experience with, with how long afterwards? And uh, any input about the effects on condensate polisher resin? Yeah, so uh, we just recommend to do it during uh, uh, the preservation uh, step because normally we have less of time and we want to keep uh, as much as FFA in the cycle and uh, not on the condensate polish or resin. So that's why we, we recommend to do that, um, but only during the preservation, not afterwards or uh, uh, in a, in a uh, longer duration, just during the, the time where the concentration is on the maximum level to, to avoid uh, 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 yeah, a release of the FFA in the, through the condensate polisher, and uh, then you have to add more in in the, in the beginning. So uh, that's why we recommend that. Yeah, Ronnie, th uh, thank you. We are we are um, into the general discussion, so just let's ask the other uh, presenters, uh, that who, uh, uh, Sabello from ESCOM or Jeff from Cogentrix or Shana from uh, Shayla from Dominion uh, if they if they have any other uh, comments on uh, uh, including condensate polisher in the cycle anybody Harry, I have a, a question about that um, I know some people do have condensate polishers and occasionally deep bed Condensate polishers. I'm wondering if anyone has comments about how they've managed the uh, pH control with a full flow deep bed condensate polisher in the cycle. Yeah. Well, there's only, um, I think there's only Ronnie that has uh, any experience. Uh, if nobody else had answered the other question, but Ronnie, do you have any experience on, on that question? I just uh, uh, couldn't hear it at very good. So, um, but so, the, um, so, the, so Ronnie, the question is uh, quite a lot of um, of ACCs, especially in the early days, were des were designed uh, not with with no thought given to what the chemistry was going to be. And as you saw in my presentation, quite a lot of them were operated at pH of nine or nine point one. They had polishers. And then it was recognized that they needed to go as we as we talked uh, previously in the other session to uh, to ha to high pH and that and that requires a different operation of the polisher. And I wondered whether you, you had had any experience. That's what Andy's question was. No, uh, sorry, I, in, for, for that time I, I cannot give you a, a explanation or any experience. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and they do, do you do you have any yourself because you came from a utility that had an ACC? Oh, yeah, that's the reason we you know, we had a struggle with between trying to raise the pH for the ACC versus uh, keeping the pH pH down for uh, effective polisher operation and and I I know it's just a balancing issue. Uh, yes. We in our terms we wound up just considering the polisher something that would slow down the process of contamination while we dealt with it rather than rather than yeah. stopping the contamination we couldn't wait you know wait for the weekend or so you just had to had to slow it down and immediately get to work on it yeah thanks i, I thought sabello might have uh, might have said something from uh, escom because the original work on this very topic was conducted uh, in conjunction with uh, dennis uh, aspen also from ESCOM used to be the chief chemist there, but that's one of the, prob the pro one of the problems that we had uh, of how you adjusted the, uh, the, 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 the polisher operation. And, uh, 
I have to say that we don't see that as as often uh, these days. That uh, the the design and the specification seems to be taking taking that into account. Uh, but uh, may, maybe uh, Sabello has has left has left us. So, uh, um, and Andy, did you have a uh, you mentioned that you might have another question? Um, yeah, this is a another topic, but I just wondering if people have comments on leaks in their uh, finned tubing, the heat exchange tubing of their ACCs. Uh, if people could comment on maybe their experience if they've had leaks, and if the cause of that was determined, we there there have not been a lot of uh, leaks uh, from the steam side, even though there's a high risk with the corrosion there. And other than ESCOM, I'm sure there's a few others, but I'm not. Uh, I'm just wondering if anyone can comment on some leaks they've experienced in ACC tube, either either steam side or water or external air side. Yeah. So does anybody uh, in the audience um, have anything to say on that? So Andy, this is Bob Trostback. Um, I got around to a lot of air cool contenders, and uh, one of the things we saw early on was freezing uh, uh, on some units at the bottom where the fans, now you have a lot of temperature control, freeze protection programs. Uh, in the systems, but bottom uh, freezing of the water at the bottom and then plugging the tube, uh, bursting the tube was uh, seeing a lot of that uh, early on. And uh, more recently, we've seen in the design of these, they got a D section, which is how they do the air removal. And you get, if the D section is tied in top to bottom uh, continuously across the street. Uh, lengthwise down the street, you can get a differential expansion going on between the D and the normal tubes. And on startups, that can be very pronounced because of the amount of air. So we had tubes pulling out of the ends of the D sections where uh, they didn't leave enough, uh, you know, they didn't segment the lower header to allow it to float up because it's colder and the other tubes are warmer because they're in startup. So they're the two that I thought were very interesting uh, in the ones that I investigated. All right, yeah, thanks, Bob. I've, I've, I've heard of some of those. Um, yeah. Okay, anyone else on anything with, uh, I'm most interested in internal corrosion, but any kind of thing that causes a leak is of interest. So. Anybody else? There was, uh, Mark, the, the whisperer, just uh, uh, made a made a comment. He he said that uh, ammonium for operation is the one for condensate polishers with ACC, and that's exa uh, 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 Mark. That was exactly what we were talking about, and what was done originally at ESCOM, and then uh, in uh, in Australian uh, units with ACC to overcome the um, to overcome the uh, the corrosion in, at the at the at the tube entries. Thank you. Thank you. Has anybody else got um, anybody else got any any comments, questions? Any Scott, any hands raised or anything? Doesn't look it doesn't look as if there is. So um, unless anybody's got any more questions, we'll close out the um, the uh, I don't know af afternoon evening for me session. Uh, Gary, the question just came in from Brandon yeah, I, Benjamin. I, I, I just saw that. Greg, um, um, Greg Robinson had his hand up. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Dooley, or, or anyone. You mentioned aluminum um, in, in your presentation uh, to start the day. Just wondered how prevalent uh, you're finding aluminum contamination. You mentioned, I think, on the steam turbine. Um, do you see that uh, often, or I guess how prevalent is it in your experience? Uh, Greg, we don't see we don't see it as much now as we did maybe five or something years ago. But um, the, there was um, there was some mysterious um, aluminium uh, aluminum, I have to say, um, <laughs> deposits. Um, in uh, on steam turbine components, 
uh, also deposits in drums in HP drums. And uh, this was a little bit of a mystery for these plants because they were totally um, all ferrous with no copper or aluminium in them. And uh, the only thing that we could come up with after after a lot of uh, work was that the outside of the of the ACC tubes uh, had aluminum on them, and uh, there was a possibility that the the welding process or the preparation process um, could um, release uh, al al aluminium uh, aluminum to the internal surfaces. And uh, but I haven't I haven't heard about uh, I haven't heard anything about that recently. But uh, the people who have uh, units with ACC should maybe just keep an eye on it. And if they see any deposits in any of these areas on the turbine or in the drums, uh, do an analysis and see if there's any um, uh, aluminum in them. Um, and the problem, of course, on the um, on the on the steam turbine is that these are very difficult deposits to get rid of. And, uh, and so we we were a little concerned, but that was basically the story, Greg, up, up to a few years ago, but we haven't heard about anything more recently. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's, you're welcome. And there's uh, one question here from Brandon uh, Benjamin. Well, Brandon, if, you, if you're still here, please raise your question. Can you, can you release him, Scott, please? Brandon, you're unmuted, if you could. Yeah, hi, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so sure. the, the, the concern that we had down here, um, we, we're in a tropical country, so we have no issues with um, with with ice or or, or or any freezing conditions. But um what we what we had over the past few years is um severe corrosion of our tubes externally. And uh, we believe that it is because of the design where um we will have entrapment of water between the fins that will actually settle down at the base of the tube on the inside and cause um serious corrosion. And that started to um, to cause um, a lot of vacuum leaks. Good, thank you. Has anyone ever else uh, ever um, experienced that situation? I have heard of that at other units, and uh, in in at least one case, it had had a lot to do with debris that was collecting at the the top of the deflagmator section where the uh, the temperature tends to be low because of the extraction of air. And so moisture was being trapped there within uh, the debris and, and sitting for extended periods and that was causing corrosion. Um, any yeah. other comments on external yes. corrosion? No? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, who's speaking? Atanu Roy, just speaking from Hammond, Thermal Europe. Hi, um, yeah, I, you, you were mentioning um, the issue or the, the experience with the aluminium. I was just wondering, we, we are also looking at incorporating stainless steel into these circuits in parallel with the air-cooled condenser. Would you expect any issues if one would have stainless steel 304 or 316 in the water steam cycle? Six tubes for the for the ACC tubes. You mean? No, no. It's it's for a booster that we we developed, and um, it's it's just a. I don't think it's an issue, but I was just wondering, uh, seeing that we have all the experts here, uh, whether there's something that that you, that might might come up. Um, it's an evaporative heat exchanger in parallel with the air cooled condenser, um, and then there we have different options for the tubing. Um, and one option is, is stainless steel. And, and if you look at the water chemistry, uh, would, would you see an issue um, considering that the stainless steel would be in the same circuit as the, the steel, the normal ferrous steel? Um, I think you would, I, 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 I don't have an answer, but I would think that, um, I, I would think uh, the oscillating stainless steels 
you would have to be careful for for obvious reasons. Yeah. There have been a couple of applications of of uh, ferritic stainless steels in yeah. um, in ACCs, um, but um, I th I think that's the only information that we have. Yeah, because um, the the problem is not so much you know it it can corrode. It's it's the the stainless steel is used mainly for the outer surface. That's the reason why we want it, and. Yeah. Um, um, so, so if there's a if there's a minimal corrosion on the inside, that that would be acceptable. Uh, I was just wondering if there's some catastrophic sort of uh, condition that might occur that you 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 can foresee. Anybody, Andy, did you have a a, a comment? My only comment is um, related to which if you're using the cooling water, if this involves Hano, cooling water that's concentrating that has fluorides in it, something of an elevated temperature, that's, that could be a concern for the stainless steel. I can't see any, any yeah. other effect that that would have on the carbon steel or the ACC. All right. Okay. Thanks. Well, Thanks, Andy. Yeah, the problem, you yeah. know, okay. Good. Thank you, uh, Hano. Uh, all right. I think that's the um, I think that's the last question for today. So I'll hand it back to uh, Scott, and he'll tell you uh, what time we're going to be uh, on charge tomorrow. Same time, same place. I think Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, tomorrow is day two, and the focus of the presentations and discussion will be design and performance moderated by Riyadh Damdan of Dominion. So we hope to see you back here tomorrow at 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. I'm coming right now. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. And uh, if you or any of your colleagues would also like to join in, please have them register for uh, access at acc-usersgroup.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott.